Hi, I'm Pebbles Turbyville. I'm the Executive Director of Horses and Humans Research Foundation, and we welcome you to our webinar Wednesday. We'll be um, hearing from the Equine Wellbeing um, Committee members who are presenting tonight. Um, Trish is moderating for us, and Molly and Kathy and Marcy will be sharing their information with you. So I'll turn it over to you, Trish. Thank you. Will you go to the next slide, please? Um, sure. So our topic is the practical applications of the five domains of animal welfare. Oops. Whoa. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, okay, there we go. <laughs> so, um, the way we understand this is uh, to changing the perspective of the human from training to relationship in order to transform the horse from tolerant or compliant to willing. So uh, I'm asking Molly first. Molly, what, what do we mean when we say we want to change perspectives? Um, thank you, Trish. Uh, go back one, please. Stay on that slide, please. Yeah. There you go. OK. Um, we want people to start thinking about horse management and behavior from the horse's perspective, to listen to the horse's side of the story. Rather than emphasize training, we want to emphasize building a relationship for the horse so that then they will respond willingly and become a very engaged partner with us no matter what we were asking of them and hopefully be better at their performances. And so how do we build relationship and willingness? Well, relationship is built in people and in animals for mutual trust. And the trust comes when we actually listen to and understand the animal's behavior, what the behavior is trying to tell us, and then we act accordingly. It's that action part is really kind of an important part of it. It's not just listening, but then do something about it. Um, next slide. The five domains. There we go. I'm glad you're doing that, Pebbles, because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, over about the last year, the committee has been studying the 2020 new update of the five domains for the assessment and evaluation of animal well-being. If you haven't seen it, I suggest you Google it. It's really quite interesting. It's quite involved. And the whole point of is we want to go from just getting by to really a, living a very full life. Um, and then the uh, next slide, please. There's a little more information about the positive effects of equine well being. If the behavior is varied and novel and the environment is challenging and lots of sensory input and things like that, you have a happy horse. If the environment is comfortable with temperature, ground, footing, space, air, odor, noise, predictability, pastures, all of that, once again, you're going to have a happy horse. Nutrition, the factors that involve the animal's access to sufficient balanced food, clean water, physical health and fitness, absence of disease, and then the important one that they add is the mental well-being. By presenting positive situations in all of these domains, then you have a horse who's a happy horse in a good mental state. They'll benefit from it they will find pleasure and comfort and then they will want to form a relationship and they will be very happy to work with you. So tonight we're gonna to present and go a little bit deeper into all of those um, areas. Next slide. This is again, uh, the five domains. This is, take a screenshot of this if you want, but it's adapted, it's a wonderful diagram adapted from Dr. Miller in New Zealand. And um, it gives, if you, this is a open access research paper on animal, the publication of animals. And if you go to that number, <laughs> it will give you the entire thing when he explains of it, how all of it, how they came about it and the different things and what happens if something causes a negative effect or if it causes a positive effect. Um, I could not copy it. Uh, and put it up for you. So um, the next best thing I can do for you is to have you find a way that you can look it up. The next slide, please. So I'll be talking about behavior. 
we often talk about negative and positive behavior, but I look at it as horses have negative and positive experiences, but their behavior is really behavior that we want or we don't want. And I do that because we want to take the judgment out of that decision of what the horse is doing. So we talk about having more wanted behavior and then trying to decide what's going on with the unwanted behavior. In effect, Behavior is just data. It's their means of communication with us. Next slide. The reason for horse's behavior. I always like this. What people think, the horse bit me, he's doing it on purpose, he's being naughty. But what's really behind the behavior are all of these other possibilities. Um, they've been triggered by something. They don't understand what we're asking of them. They don't trust us. They have a pain somewhere. They're missing their herd. They don't feel safe. They have some sort of unmet needs through their living conditions. So what we want to emphasize is what really is behind the behavior and how do we go deeper into that behavior. Next slide. How do the horses process information? All of us process um, our sensor, sensory input so that we can understand the environment that we're in and how to react to it. With um, horses, they are sentient beings like us, but they're very, very different. And it's important to recognize that they have a different way of thinking also. They're visual thinkers, they think in pictures. I am a verbal thinker, so it's not easier for me to figure out what a horse who thinks in pictures is thinking like when I'm picturing things or thinking of things in words. But we have to truly understand what they are thinking. Their sensory systems and their neurological systems are very different from ours. Their um, eyes set further apart than humans. They can see farther away than we can. They see in a panoramic vision. They see binocular vision straight ahead. And they see it, one eye can rotate all the way back and see in the other direction. I can't even imagine what that looks like. And the pictures that much flash through their brain as they're using their eyes this way. We know they see some colors we don't see. Um, we know, I mean, we know they don't see some colors we see. I don't think they think they don't think red, but you know, they can actually see in the dark really, really well. So possibly they can see an infrared, which we can't. Again, it's another sensory difference. So what does it look like when you can't really see colors or do they possibly see colors we don't? They say birds do, why couldn't the horses? Who knows? Um, their ears are much better than ours. They can hear coming in different directions. Uh, there's also some thought that they might be able to do echolocation and have a sense of where they are. Like if they're riding in arena, they know how close they are to the wall and things like that from hearing. There's not been much research done on smell, but we all know that they like to smell. They like to smell everything. They wanna smell your hand. They wanna sniff any new toys, things like that. They definitely have a sense of smell. In fact, I heard someplace, so I haven't been able to track it down, that there are people training horses for search and rescue, that they actually can turn the horse loose and give them a sense to follow. And they will go and zigzag across a pasture, just like a, a dog would, following a scent, pick up a scent, follow the scent, lose the scent, search back and forth for it, and actually have been able to find people that are hiding in the woods. So this says a whole lot about them that most of us have never thought of before. Hmm. We know they have taste. We know they like and don't like. I have a pony that doesn't like apples. Don't ask me why, but he won't eat apples. I cut him up and put him in his feet and he won't touch it. So we definitely know they have different tastes, but again, there's not any research on this. So we really can't decide what they taste. We do know, however, that touch is very, very important to them. Um, mutual grooming, they prefer strokes and they prefer scratches, not patting them. We often tell our clients or our people, oh, pat the horse, pat the horse. We should be saying stroke the horse or find that sweet spot where they like to be scratched. And that's um, a really good way to have people be able to scratch that sweet spot. The other thing that we don't talk about because we don't have it, and they do believe that horses and many animals have a built-in GPS. Think of the migrating animals like the sea turtles and the birds that can go thousands and thousands of miles and find one tiny little piece of land that they come back to. If you're ever lost somewhere out on your horse, just drop the reins and tell them go home and they will get you there. Something most of us can't do, at least I can for sure. Again, their brain processes are different. 
there has been some research that shows that they recognize symbols and they can explain, they can tell their owners whether they want a blanket, they don't want a blanket, or they want to stay the way they are. Like I have a blanket, no, I don't want to take it off, or I have a blanket, yes, leave it on. Um, I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. The way I tell is I walk in the stall and when they turn their butt to me and raise a hind foot, that means no blanket. That's the way <laughs> I figure it out. Um, the other important thing about the brain that I really like is the thalamus. We have a thalamus right in the center of our brain. It's kind of the control center. So the sensory system brings input to the thalamus and the th thalamus makes a decision. If you put your hand on a hot stove or something hot, it goes immediately to the thalamus and the thalamus immediately says, remove right hand up the stove. However, in horses, when they get some sort of a crisis sensory sense, particularly fear or pain, it bypasses the thalamus and goes immediately to the, um, to the motor reaction. So if you've ever wondered how you were sitting upon the back of a horse, uh, not paying a whole lot of attention, the horse was very relaxed and all of a sudden you find yourself on the ground and you're not quite sure how you got there because the horse reacts quicker than we do and they think quicker than we do. So once a horse starts to get into flight mode, you can't stop him. You're not gonna catch him quick enough. You've gotta catch it much earlier and much quicker. Um, my favorite references for understanding the brain is a book by Janet Peters called Horse Brain, Human Brain. Very good in the practical aspects of like how a horse needs to process something when you're trying to teach them something, you need to give them time to process it. We've all worked with clients like that, so we know what that's like. Um, also the work of Dr. Stephen Peters, he's a neuroscientist, um, and he has uh, lots of YouTubes and work on actual uh, brain, um, surgical brains, where he'll dissect a brain and show you all the different parts and what they do. And then I should have gone to the next slide. Sorry, I missed that one. Um, oh, okay. Uh, quickly mentioned biomechanics. We all know pretty much how that works, but it's important that we understand it very, very much. This is, um, people are on the top with cognitive and experience comes down, we get a little bit of sensory input, we get a perceptions, we get an emotion and it causes a behavior. For animals, they get, especially horses who are visual thinkers, they get a sensory input with a little bit of experience and it's called bottom-up decisions. They get their perception, they get their emotion and then that causes their behavior. What causes the unwanted behavior? Number one, pain. Second, fear. Fear can be divided to anxiety, frustration, or discomfort. Those are your basic, basic things. Next slide. So emotions then drive the behavior. And the way we tell that is by learning to understand body language, deepen our awareness of it. And the best way you can do that is go sit out in the pasture and watch your horses in a herd and how they behave. When you groom the horses or when you teach your riders to groom the horses, have them pay attention. Did the horse flinch there? Did the horse like that spot? is the horse kind of hurt over in that area. Um, and that's a sign that something's going on there. There's a discomfort there and we need to figure out what it is. And then let them know, we all know the unwanted behavior, the kicking and the bucking and the biting, but that means you're not listening to me. They're trying to tell us you're just not listening to me. Um, and that's when it's gone too far and you probably aren't gonna get it, to get it uh, changed. You're gonna have to go back to the beginning and start over again with that trust. So next slide. And I will hand it, we will hand it over to Kathy. Okay, so thank you, Molly, for uh, that uh, exploration of behavior. And so Kathy, can you uh, tell us how has the living environment for domesticated horses affected their well-being? Thank you, Trish. Um, we have we have this, the science, this slide is about the science of understanding management. Um, and that's come into effect because we've taken horses from the wild where they existed over 50,000 years and they've always adapted to their environment. But we've brought horses into our care and we need to take responsibility for all of the things that we've changed. Um, we always need to be ready to learn a better way to house them, feed them, and manage their health. Um, 
research on management and welfare continues to change as science supports and teaches us how to see from the horse's perspective. New and updated standards of care are easily found online and HHRF is a, is a good resource for that education. Again, horses in the wild have, they have free choice. They get to choose where to sleep, where to eat, where, when, to, and when to move, if it feels safe or not safe in an area. And when we house them and pasture them, um, they don't have that choice and they only eat what we provide. So everything is on us to manage that in, a, in the best way possible. So that, that's the domain of, um, of their living environment. Next slide, please. So again, that's in the wild, they get to search for their water. So they make a conscious choice. Where's the water? Um, are there any predators? And even the social system, they, they're with their families and each family member has a job and they know how to do that. And they're, they're always discovering and remembering what their job is each day as it comes on. Next slide, please. Oh. And well, the domesticated horses is the opposite. We change their environment and we ask them to have a relationship with us. Um, what's an appropriate environment? One that doesn't cause pain or suffering or fear or any unnecessary stress. One based on behavioral, cognitive, emotional health. All needs to be met in, in the environment. Uh, we need to make sure as humans that we don't misuse our power. So if we've chosen an, an environment, even, even say mud, everybody's seen mud, experienced mud, mud and manure. How do, you, how do you manage a simple thing like mud, manure, fencing, all of things are in their environment uh, from the simplest thing to the most difficult thing, a, a use of space, all of those things. Next slide, please. So how do horses choose to spend their time? And these numbers came from a study that was based on observing horses in the wild. Oops. And right. um, they found that, that they spend <laughs> at least 60% of their time foraging and, and eating. Um, and that's, uh, that's about 18 hours a day. And um, Creating this in a domestic setting can really be a challenge. And, but if we mismanage how, how and when horses eat, it can be life-threatening. So managing where and how to feed your horse is key to um, equine well-being. Learning, and, and again, learn the latest research. And that's what part of what we've done with this PowerPoint is to, is to explore the latest research and also how, do, how have horses done it for 50,000 years? And how, and how does it change? Um, and there's never one way, and it's always gonna depend on what are your resources and what are you doing with your horses and, and then helping them to be the best that they can be. Next slide, please. So these are some examples of meeting their needs. And, and what's, this is where we wanna start looking from the horse's perspective. Next slide, please. Oh, there's the last part of it. So <laughs> a little slow on that one, but you know, fancy, fancy, beautiful facility. But if the horse thinks of it as a prison, it's not from the horse's perspective, you know, beautiful architecture doesn't meet their needs. Next slide, please. Um, individual paddocks, but, and again, the um, a cubicles, right? Does it feel like a cubicle or does it protect the horse from another issue? Um, so learning how to use it and can they mutual groom? Socially, do they, what's their relationship? Um, and learning how to, see from the horse's perspective. Next slide. 
there's another half to this. There we go. So would you rather be in your cubicle by yourself, surrounded with people on all sides, but you can't see them or talk to them? Or would you like to socially um, be relaxing and, and with your group of people? So it's seeing from that, from the horse, how does the horse feel about it? Next slide, please. So unrestricted movement. And again, what does that, what does it look like? So and this is about the five domain model is a method of learning how to assess uh, and manage the well being. Horses need to move. They get to choose when to eat, choose when to find shelter, choose areas for rolling and sleeping, um, and choose who to spend time with. And if we and if they don't have those choices, then we need to see is that causing a stress and how much stress and how can we how can we do it better? Next slide, please. Free, there's lots of different ways to create free choice feeding. Um, and again, it, there's the, when we get into nutrition, we'll bring up the reasons why there's physically, mentally, and emotionally, horses need to be eating on a regular basis. And so even noticing how much time is, how much time it happens where there's no food in their stomach. Uh, and in their in their digestive system. It's an, an important issue to look at. Next slide, please. <laughs> Open housing. Um, this can be a tough one, but there's all different ways that we can learn how to adjust our environment to give them more choices. Next slide. Comfortable resting and sleeping areas. It might be as simple as getting a load of sand uh, where the horses like to congregate and give them, give them a soft place where they can lie down. Next slide. Variations in the environment. And this is something that not everybody understands how to use. And I would encourage people to go online and do some exploration of what does that look like? Again, in the wild, the horses would have to choose, is it safe to walk in the woods? Uh, is it too rocky on that, uh, on that path? Wh how to maneuver that? And they have to, use, they have to use all their senses as opposed to standing in a cubicle or a small paddock where they're just, they have no choices. Next slide, please. These are some ideas of unrestricted movement. It, it can be a simple thing. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, this was where the paddocks were made um, and the horses were kept individually. And one way they adopted it was they just started putting in gates that allow horses to move from paddock to paddock. So that they went from having no choices to being able to choose. Next slide, please. And how do they express normal behavior? How do they show relationship? Uh, playing, choosing who to stand with, who to graze next to, mutual grooming. And just notice in your program, do you, is the, is, are they given those choices? And if not, how might you incorporate them? Next slide, please. Long-term effects of restricted movement. Weaving, cribbing, wind, sick, wind sucking, wood chewing, head tossing, depression, aggression. We've all seen all these things. We're asking to look from the horse's perspective if it is, and what's the domain that, that the behavior comes from and explore it, research it, look for it, ask other people, um, and look for ways to make it better. Next slide. And again, this is traditionally horses have been kept in stalls, might have turnout, might not have turnout. Um, a, a 
that's how we've always done it, but is that the best? Questionable, a couple of hours of, of turnout. A better, a better management is a gr more turnout where the, um, but if the horses still don't have a lot of choice, it's not the best. Better is living in a group with sufficient space with some choice and variation and best being 24 hour turnout living in a group with multiple resources. Space that encourages movement and choice and opportunity to choose equine friends. How can we get there? And what's one, ch one change that we could make to improve their uh, living environment? And I'll pass it off to Marcy. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Um, we're running a little bit late. Uh, folks, just if you can move just a little more quickly, Marcy, to help us catch up as we move to look into basic equine nutrition. And so, Marcy, um, we know that good nutrition is the basis for health and fitness and overall well being of our horses. But in order to understand how to best provide for our horses nutritional needs, what do we need to know about their unique digestive system? Well, I am not an expert in equine nutrition, but I have the privilege of being a good friend of world renowned equine nutritionist Don Capper, who has generously contributed to and reviewed this content. There are many challenges to provide proper quantity, quality and balanced nutrition for our horses. I could not figure out a way to make this both fun and informative, so I'm going with informative. I'll focus on practically usable information and try to give you as many whys as possible. Next slide, please. So the horse's digestive system in its entirety is about 100 feet long. It's very unique. It's very complex. Horses are non-ruminant herbivores or hindgut digesters. Their digestive system is meant to receive small amounts of forage on a very frequent basis. The average horse secretes about 20 to 25 gallons of saliva a day. So just close your eyes for a second and visualize five five gallon buckets full of saliva. Saliva acts as a lubricant and it contains digestive enzymes and buffers to help maintain a healthy gut pH. Horses have the smallest stomach in relation to their body size of all domestic animals. So digestive passes quickly through the stomach and very little absorption takes place there, although it continues to produce up to 16 gallons a day, so that's like your car gas tank, of acidic gastric juices, whether there's food in it or not. The majority of non-structural carbohydrates, which are the simple sugars and starches, protein and fat are digested by enzymes in the 70-ish foot long small intestine, and they're absorbed into the bloodstream through the intestine walls. The hindgut is made up of the cecum, the large and small colon, and the rectum. The primary functions of the hindgut are water reabsorption and fermentation, which is the breakdown of dietary fiber or the structural carbohydrates from forages by microbes such as bacteria, yeast, and protozoa. The cecum is a four foot long muscular fermentation vat that holds seven to nine gallons of undigested fibrous feed. Fermentation in the hindgut is where the bulk of the horse's energy is produced by microbes and is the key reason that horses' diets must be primarily forage and not grain or concentrates. The large and small colon make up almost half of the horse's digestive system. Together are about 20 to 24 feet long and they hold about 25 gallons. The fermentation process continues through the parts of the colon and finally the rectum about a foot long and anyone who's ever maneuvered a, a, a shovel in a barn nose, horses will produce about 30 to 50 pounds of manure per day. Next slide. So now with that Question. amazingly abbreviated uh, lesson on the unique equine digestive system, thank you, Marcy. What are some useful and practical guidelines for feeding our horses for optimum health? Well, so you need to provide your horse with frequent access to high quality forage as close to 18 hours a day as possible. If you need to, you can use a slow feeder or another restrictive measure to limit the volume and the speed of intake. Horses should be provided about 2% of their body weight in high quality forage daily. So that equates to about 20 pounds of grass or hay for the average thousand pound horse. Horse hay is usually grown for volume and not for quality or nutritional content. 
ideally have your hay tested. So you'll know its protein, calorie, and fiber content, and what minerals and other nutrients need to be added to your horse's diet. You can find information on testing at equianalytical.com. As the hay plant matures, the structural carbohydrate or the fiber level increases and protein, calories, and mineral levels drop. So the point at which the hay is cut plays a huge role in its nutritional content and the bioavailability of nutrients. It's harder for the horse's body to access the protein in more mature hay and harder still for older horses. Next slide, please. A hay belly is not a place where fat is stored. It's often indicative of a diet of overly mature hay, which has coarser stems and open grass seed heads. Grasses, both pasture and hay, no matter how beautiful they look, rarely provide the quantity and recommended ratios of minerals or balanced bioavailable amino acids needed for optimum health and muscling. Base your feeding program on high quality forage and then consider feeding a ration balancer specifically made to supply vitamins, minerals, and balanced amino acids that are lacking in the forage you feed. Have free choice balanced mineral block or, or minerals block or loose accessible to your horse and provide a separate supply of salt for your horse, ideally located near his water source. Allow your horse to eat with his head down to encourage adequate saliva production and to minimize potential respiratory problems. Ensure that your horse has frequent access to at least 10 gallons a day of fresh, clean, temperate water throughout the day and night. Maintain a consistent feeding schedule and only feed concentrates to meet nutrient requirements that are not met by your horse's forage. Whether you feed concentrates or a ration balancer, you must feed the recommended amount on the bag. If you feed concentrates, do so in small meals, not exceeding five pounds per thousand pounds of body weight. Feed labels do not indicate the quality or bioavailability of the nutritional content in the bag. You might want to have your bagged feed tested as well, which you can also do through Equi Analytical. The crude protein percentage on feed labels is not the same as balanced bioavailable amino acids, which are needed for muscle development as well as other bodily functions. 10 of the 22 amino acids are considered essential because the body cannot manufacture adequate amounts of those amino acids to meet the horse's needs, so they must be fed in proper balance every day. Here is a giant point. A diet lacking in the proper balance of amino acids can result in the horse breaking down their own muscle tissue to meet their daily body function requirements. If increased calories are needed, utilize highly digestible or fermentable fiber and or fat rather than the simple carbohydrates and sugars found in cereal grains. This leads to less excitability and is more energy efficient. Three best sources of fermentable fiber are beet pulp with no molasses, soybean hulls, and alfalfa. The reason it's so essential to make any feed and or forage changes slowly over at least seven to 10 days is to allow the gut micropopulation to adapt. The forage type and composition that your horse eats determines the makeup of the microbial population of the hindgut. And next. So we know that it is essential to monitor your horse's body condition and top line mus muscling on a regular basis. Marcy, can you explain the difference between the Hennigate BCS and TES and how to best evaluate our horses for optimal body condition? Yes, so fat cover and adequate muscling are not the same thing. A horse can have sufficient fat cover, like be a five on the body condition score, and still have very poor muscling, which can make saddle fit very challenging, weight carrying very painful, and susceptibility to discomfort, pain, and acute or chronic injury or health problems are long-term damage very likely. Next slide, please. So the Hennigke body condition scoring measures fat cover. It goes from one, which is an emaciated horse, to nine, which is obese, and five is considered ideal for most horses in most circumstances. Next slide, please. The top line evaluation scoring evaluates muscling. I'm not gonna make any comparisons about how some of us may gain or lose weight, but horses lose muscle from the front to the back and they gain from the back to the front. So the withers area is the first to lose muscle and it's the last to gain. Next slide, please. 
The top line evaluation scoring reads like a report card. It goes from A through D, there's no F, and A is ideal and anything less will have potential problems and is an indication that the horse's diet is lacking in balanced bioavailable amino acids. Next slide, please. Here's a great visual example of a horse that has a good body condition score. I'd probably give him a five, which is ideal, but yet he has a very poor top line. I'd give him a C. And we see so many of our horses this way and riding a horse in this condition will over the long run cause problems. Next slide, please. And so the main takeaway points from all that information are that the key is balanced nutrition. Learn what your horse's nutritional needs are. Learn to monitor your horse's body condition score and top line evaluation score. Learn what nutrients are in your forages and only feed the difference between what is in your forage and what your horse needs. Thank you. Thank you. That was packed in a lot in those few minutes. And that's the next slide. Uh, turning to Molly. Uh, in physical health, what is the new perspective on physical health and fitness for the horses? What we would like to do is integrate a broader view of the connections of all of the components of good health to look deeper into what causes it and how to better manage overall horse care, especially for chronic issues. Fitness needs to be tailored to the specific requirements of the job we ask of the horse. As you can see here, very different fitness requirements for each of these horses. Next slide. Some things to consider. This is probably an area of physical health where there's the most research done because veterinarians love to research every little thing about how one muscle works and how one um, nerve ending works and so forth. So there's quite a bit of research on this, but to me, the trick is to how is it all connected? Just because a horse is lame in the front right foot doesn't necessarily mean it's not the problem in the rear left. And we have to be able to look deeper than just what's immediately before our, our, in front of us. Again, the things to look at, of course, are the hooves. We have, we'll have some more pictures of that. What do the eyes look like? Are they bright? Are they, are they engaged or are they just droopy and burned out and sad and not happy? Um, look at the ears. Are they active? Look at the direction they're going in. Look at the teeth. Always look at the teeth. Um, a horse tosses his head a lot. The bit can be a teeth problem very easily. Um, what does their skin look like, their hair coat? Uh, Marcy talked about the muscling and the symmetry. I always like to look at the symmetry. If the horse is walking in front of you, watch the hip drop on both sides as he takes a step. Is it even or does one side drop lower than the other one? And is the other one stuck up high? They should both be even and they should both drop evenly. So always looking at symmetry, look at the symmetry of the pace, which may tell you a clue that she, there's a soreness or a lameness in one of the legs. Ulcers is a big problem for all of our horses and it can cause all kinds of problems. Check their um, manure and urine. If you muck in stalls, you get to do that every day. Understand about vitals, the signs and how to take them. Make sure the people that work in your barn know how to do that. I can never remember what the normal is. So take a baseline and that's temperature, that's heart rate, and the um, when you pinch the skin, how quickly does that come back and look at the color of the gums and things like that. Make a list of that so that everybody can be aware of all of those different signs. Be careful on your medication and the management of medication. If your horse is regularly on something with the veterinarian, pay, co pay close attention that it's done appropriately and properly. And as Marcy said, always look at the top line and the body conditioning score. You can go back. Whoa. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoa. I feel sorry. <laughs> Marcy. There it is. Okay. We're, we're going down to soundness. Go down to soundness. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I don't know what happened. I touched it and it like went crazy. There, there we go. Yay. Yay. Okay. Obviously, we are not going to have horses in our barn that look like that on the left, but there are people that do have horses like that that look on the left and the horses on the right that look happy and healthy, but you always have to be looking for signs of possible injury and um, hopefully we, I never get a horse in that position. If you ever do get one, work with a veterinarian and how to fix them because they can be brought along, but it takes a lot of work. Next slide.
teeth. Again, you're never going to see horses in your program that have, have, have teeth quite as bad as these are, but it's really important that you look at them. One of the first way to look at it is to just look at the, open their horse's mouth and look at the teeth. Do they, do the front ones all meet? Are they all even and online? If they're not, there's something off in the TMJ joint up at the top of the jaw. Um, also, again, horses that fuss and throw their head around a lot can have mouth problems. They can have sharp hooks in their teeth as shown in figure nine down in the lower right, which is an ex a, a total exaggeration, um, but easy enough to find. There's always, don't forget your um, at least annual dental checkup. I know one of the things veterinarians tell me they wish more people would be aware of is to get that dental checkup because it's really important to the horses ability to eat and all the good things about processing the food. Next slide. Uh, and hoofs um, in the middle shows what it's supposed to be like when it's cut under, when it's too far forward, too much toe. You can see the kind of the typical areas, horses that flake off areas, uh, uneven feet, not so much the color, but when they start looking all weird like that, um, I talked to my um, carrier actually yesterday, she's a barefoot trimmer and I said, okay, what are the three most important things you wish people knew about um, hoofs? And she said, number one, nutrition, because the reason the hoof is the way it is primarily goes back to nutrition, especially adding minerals, particularly zinc and copper uh, to their supplements when they start having problems like some of these feet that are really bad. And the other thing is movement. Again, horses need to move and move and move. The more they move, the better it is for the hoofs. And if they can go over different terrain and up and down hills and over rocks, that's all good for the hoofs also. Next slide. Hair coat. Again, hopefully you don't have any horses that look like this or that have any parasites that look like that. But this is the way it can be. So um, pay close attention to the hair coat as it, as it grows out. And is it really, really thick? Does it not shed? Does the horse basically just show depression or stress like he does up there in the top right? A dull coat. Uh, again, nutrition is what makes the coat shine. It's also what makes the hoofs look good and grow well and be strong and hard. So again, it's not just saying, oh, he's got a bad hoof or he's got a really rotten coat. It's like, okay, let's go back and sit, look, let's look deeper and say, okay, what's What's with the nutrition? Is he getting to move around enough? Is he stressed out? What is what is causing him stress? And again, for the parasites, um, check your horses regularly. They don't all have to be wormed all the time. Get their manure check for um, the egg count so you know how often that you need to do uh, for parasites, but they can really mess up a horse and cause colic and even death. Next slide. Okay, this is the fitness part. If the animal is adequately conditioned aerobically and anaerobically for their job. The, I think go to the next slide. I'm not sure, I can't remember. Yeah, oh, back up a one, sorry. Go back to the last one. Um, I had to look it up because I'm not a health uh, gym person. So I didn't, I had to look up what aerobically and anaerobically looks is. And, Aerobically is when you're getting more oxygen. So you're exercising in order to get more oxygen. And so that's where you, for a racehorse, they've got to be able to have, be able to breathe and be able to do a lot of exercise and still get a lot of oxygen and it helps them to, to breathe. Anaerobically is strictly for muscle and it's not about oxygen. It's about the um, putting muscle on and it's generally intensive work over short periods of time. Whereas the aerobic is intensive or medium intensive work or intensive work over longer periods of time to build up the breathing and the breath. Next slide. The other things you need to consider when assessing the fitness of equines, it's very important is to really know all of the health issues, all of the different things we've talked about and what, what do they come with uh, when they come to you or what has their previous history been? Age certainly has considerations uh, for health and how strong they can be and how active they can be and how fit they can be. Um, the two horses in the photograph, I looked it up. The one on the left is 30 years old and the one on the pony on the right is 28 years old and they're still working actively. Um, 
what was their prior job and the level of fitness? Did, did they consistently been a pasture potato and now you're going to try to make them a trail horse? Or were they consistently been a racehorse and now you're going to try to ask them to walk around uh, in, in circles and walk trot with little kids? So know what their level of fitness has been and that gives you an idea of what where you need to start from. The other thing that really struck me is about lengthy layoffs, four weeks or longer, is shown to significantly reduce an older horse's ability to get fit. So although we all like to say, oh, it's winter, class, classes are closed for three months, we're just gonna lay all the horses off. Um, you're looking for trouble when it comes to bringing them back to fitness. They still need a reg regular fitness program, even when they're not in their classes. Um, breeds, genetics, confirmation, <coughs> normal. Some are normal and some are abnormal, but always again, start with the top line and the body, I always <laughs> body, body conditioning score. <laughs> I always forget that. That's the first place to start when you're um, working with your fitness of your equine and then make it appropriate for um, the work that you intend to be doing with the animal. Thank you. Kathy. Thank you, Molly. So we just have uh, five minutes, uh, Kathy, to move through the mental states and um, thank you um feels a little bit like what they the speed dating so we're going to keep going <laughs> with um talking about the mental state the mental state is uh, is when you bring them all together it's how is the horse behaving in each domain and how is he doing and it, giving it a bit of a score next slide please optimal health that's what we're talking about and it's 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 possible to score whether they're surviving or thriving or truly living at their best that's what we're talking about what can we do better next slide please sentient beings are we really being sharing partnership and respect with a, a thinking being noticing how they feel. Next slide, please. When you look at well being, what's the cause of an unwanted behavior? And uh, we've gone through all the logistics of why you might get run over by a horse um, without realizing it because we don't move fast, our brains don't work the same way. Our eyes don't work the same way. And sometimes we get in tough positions. How can we do that better? Um, so the horse on the left is, he's in flight mode. The horse on, on the right possibly is in uh, freeze or depression, uh, shut down. How can, we, how can we change that? That's an unwanted behavior. What is the cause? Next slide, please. We want our horses to be curious. They can only be curious when they're not afraid. Um, that's what we want to start and ask, finding out what does the horse need to be in that state of mind where he's curious and seeking to engage. Next slide, please. Noticing when, so curiosity and fear cannot both be present in the brain. It, it uses different neural connectors. And that's what we wanna start looking at. Um, and it is possible to train our brain with curiosity and play. One of the things I've done my whole life is I've practiced thinking like a horse until I can do it really easily. It's just like playing the piano. You can train yourself to do it and you can notice what how you can assist the horse in choosing curiosity instead of fear next slide please in understanding what what does an unwanted behavior look like what does fight look like flight freeze even fidget and faint how many people have seen a horse on the cross ties and they start fidgeting you know is it a lack of training is it there's something outside or is it, does he have to go to the bathroom? What's the, what's the cause of that unwanted behavior? And um, a wanted behavior, relaxed, engaged, and cooperative. Is he looking where you're looking? Is he choosing to come with you? 
Next slide, please. So the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic is your fight, flight, freeze. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. What do those mean and how do we use that? We've got to look at, um, and because if you can learn how to engage the parasympathetic nervous system, you're gonna have a calm horse that trusts you, that, can, that you can develop a relationship with and work in partnership with. So the frame of their body is the frame of their mind. So if their head, if they're level headed, their eye is soft and paying attention, if their tail's relaxed, if their ears are, are not, um, you know, as the head is not up and ears pointed, looking at something in fear, just learning how to read their body language is going to help you learn the difference between fight, flight, and freeze, or rest, digest, and um, shifting from one to the other where they're, they're releasing the fear and moving into a place of curiosity and calmness. Next slide, please. Veterinarians have developed something called the grimace scale. And because pain is always, if pain is the source of the stress for the horse, you have to know it. And so they've discovered the muscles that, that um, change in the horse's face as an indicator for pain. We look at the ears, the eye wrinkles, and it, also the squinting around the eye, the nostrils, the lips, the jaw, and the cheeks. Next slide, please. You can't train away pain. So pain is, it might be, um, it might come, it might be a source from any of the five domains. So if you can figure out whether it's nutrition, is it environment, is it uh, social, is what's the behavior, what's the indicator of the pain. Um, for people, we use the smiley faces. So recognizing what is the smiley face of a, of a, pain, a horse with no pain, what's the smiley face of a horse with acute pain and how do we put a score on it? And it's, it's actually, it is possible to do that. Next slide, please. So if a horse is not in pain and he, and he feels safe and he has trust, then he's going to be in a state of well-being. He's going to be healthy and happy. Next slide, please. So we're gonna take a few slides to practice perspective, your perspective or the horse's perspective. And in this slide, you're seeing the, the uh, you know, who is saying, oh God, poor horse. Is it woman one, woman two, horse one, horse two? And it depends on what your perspective is. Next slide, please. And it would be hard to look at this horse and see uh, and not see that he's healthy and he's calm and relaxed. And next slide, please. And this is the same horse. So if you start looking at the ear, the eye, the jaw, the lip, the muzzle, the coat, and actually his weight is, is okay. And this is where the body score gives you some information, but not enough. Can we go back, back a slide, please? This horse, it, it's, it's almost hard to see it's the same horse. <laughs> if you look at the, the ears, the eye, the jaw, it <laughs> doesn't look like the same horse. And certainly the coat, this horse, nutrition, all of his needs are being met in all of the domains. Next slide. And it's, this is part of training your eye how to read the health and the well being and break it down and really look at all of the pieces. Next slide. And again, this is a horse that came to a center for, or came to a facility for rehabilitation 
it's the same horse. So if you look at the ear, the eye, the chewing muscles in the cheek, um, his chin, his lip, his mouth, his muzzle, um, completely different from left to right. The horse on the right being in optimal health. Yeah, next slide. Again, this is the same horse about three months apart. Um, looking at those same things in the face. The face is a really good indicator, especially the eye and the mouth, just like uh, uh, horses will grind their teeth when they're frustrated. It's, I haven't seen a lot of them do it, but they'll do it. So really looking at the cheek, the jaw, the eye, the ear, the muzzle, and looking to see what's going on. Next slide. And this horse, and again, how do you develop partnership and trust? This horse is healthy and he was looking at a crowd of 2000 cheering people. And you can kind of just see in his body that he's like, I trust my people. And he also, he got, so he, he liked cheering crowds because he was convinced they were cheering for him. We would take him to baseball games to be part of the opening ceremony. He feels safe, even though there's a loudspeaker and music. So learn how to read your horse and um, do the best you can until you know better, then you can do better. This is about understanding, making better choices for the horses and they will then do a better job for you. You will have the partnership that you seek. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, we've come to about the end of the hour, and we're going to stay on for questions for those of you who can uh, stay on and join us. But if you need to go, that's fine. This is being recorded, and the questions will be part of the recording. You can catch up on that if you need to go. But um, Lori, um, do do you have do we have any questions in the chat? We do not. Okay. Uh, so is let's so open it for questions from uh, those of you who are attending you can unmute and um speak up there's it's a small group so i think we can go ahead any questions that you might have of, of our presenters quiet bunch no question wow i guess we said it all then right <laughs> I'll add one comment. Um, one of my favorite quotes from an uh, old baseball player called Chester Page is, it ain't what you don't know that hurts you. It's what you know that isn't so. So <laughs> I challenge you, hopefully you've learned something you didn't know before during these talks. And I also hope that there's something you have always done all your life because that's the way you all have always done it. And maybe you'll start taking a second look at maybe we could do this a little bit better so that's that's what our hope is for our and what we and we we packed in a lot of information and uh uh you know going out and i i know i i got a new take on the uh, nutrition issue um during the pandemic my horses didn't get as much exercise either as, as they were used to and so i need to attend to that and um uh, this, this uh, gave me a good reminder. Um, I think we all, uh, and there's certainly a number of things that I need to uh, explore in more detail that we couldn't uh, do so today. But um, thank you all for coming. And I'll turn it back over to Pebbles. I was about to say, when I saw this at the PATH conference, um, I really liked the whole paddock and opening the gates and so that horses could go in and out so i thought you know in a paddock most of the time if they're in a paddock well, at least my experiences it was because we didn't they couldn't play with a bunch with others or perhaps they needed didn't they would get in trouble or hurt themselves or um so i kind of like the smaller paddocks but opening the gates kind of gives them a choice to be able to roam around and explore. I thought that was really a nice diagram, but the cubicles kind of really 
hit me too as far as you know we think stalls are great um or maybe small paddocks are but those cubicles i don't like to be in a cubicle so yeah anyway any other well, comments? It's, it's really it's really a challenge in many of our situations, the barns that we're in and the settings, how we move in the direction of some of these um, principles of really ensuring the horse's well-being with greater choice for movement, as you're pointing out. And and so just like with the uh, getting a creative approach with the grazers the grazing um mm -hmm. you know those slow feeders and and uh, some of those uh, the plans that are coming out now for just revamping pastures it's just they're really encouraging and i have friends who have uh revamped their pastures for who and then over the coming years had significantly lower vet bills their horses uh, uh, became much more healthy uh, as a, just as a result of of uh, instituting the um, Paradise Pasture Plan, and um, so yeah, it's a it's a creative have, challenge. I do have a couple comments in the chat now. One, um, Nancy Heller asked, "How can we get this copy of the slides?" <laughs> the copies of the slides. This slideshow is is pretty big, and so we had to share it through Google Docs uh because of the size so um i would wait for the recording uh, and you could see the all the the whole presentation and the slides in that in that recording and and when will that be posted um as soon as my volunteer does it <laughs> in, in is, the next few days in the next which few is days. usually a week uh, at a week. the most yeah and okay and i usually put on social media when it that is up and um to please visit it um and margo clausen says thank you for a great presentation yay <laughs> you're welcome thanks for attending i have one other comment like always is that i think it's vital that especially these information that we have research behind that you actually get your board of directors behind it because they'll say, oh, no, we don't have the money to do it. But once you can show that you're going to have a healthy, happy horse that's going to last longer, going to be healthier longer, and you're going to have less vet bills and everything else, um, that, that that's why they ought to do it. And it, it isn't enough just for the barn manager to know this. All the volunteers have to be trained in, in many of these kinds of awarenesses. And even if they can just tell you, um, you know, this horse tried to kick somebody today, you know, and go figure out what that meant. Um, but it's it's really important that everybody is possible in the organization, but don't forget about your board of directors that they understand it also. So show the show the replay to your board of directors. How about that? <laughs> and then tell them you want money to change your pastures or whatever it is you want to change. <laughs> Good point, Molly. And I'll just add to that that you know, happy, healthy, engaged horse it is is much more beneficial to your program and you will see over time much more incredible results and have a much more sustainable program and your horses will be able to work for a much longer period of time so it's an investment really i was going to yeah. add the um one of the way to use the five domains is to uh, actually develop a scoring system and it's really simple and it could just be something as um was the you know was the footing excellent or was it less optimal and and then talk about ways to make that better or was the behavior was it mild or was it severe and helping give your it's it becomes a tool for volunteers and staff to share information and if you don't do it then it, it doesn't get shared so learning how to do it and developing a system for doing it this is one way to help develop that whether you're measuring pain behavior or something having to do with the facility yes all right well thank everyone for coming tonight and i am now going to hit the pause button